February 3rd, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Mark chapter 6 of the New Testament. Now Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did he get these ideas? And what is this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these miracles that are done through his hands? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And aren't his sisters here with us? And so they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own house. He was not able to do a miracle there except to lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed because of their unbelief. Then he went around among the villages and taught. Jesus called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. He gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, and to put on sandals but not to wear two tunics. He said to them, Wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the area. If a place will not welcome you or listen to you as you go out from there, Shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and preached that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Now King Herod heard this, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and because of this, miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah. Others said, he is a prophet like one of the prophets from the past. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men, arrested John, and bound him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had repeatedly told Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not because Herod stood in awe of John and protected him since he knew that John was a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard him, he was thoroughly baffled, and yet he liked to listen to John. But a suitable day came when Herod gave a banquet on his birthday for his court officials, military commanders, and leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guest. The king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you want, and I will give it to you. He swore to her, Whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. So she went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? Her mother said, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she hurried back to the king and made her request, I want the head of John the baptizer on a platter immediately. Although it grieved the king deeply, he did not want to reject her request because of his oath and his guest. So the king sent an executioner at once to bring John's head, and he went and beheaded John in prison. He brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When John's disciples heard this, they came and took his body and placed it in a tomb. Then the apostles gathered around Jesus and told him everything they had done and taught. He said to them, Come with me privately to an isolated place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and there was no time to eat. So they went away by themselves in a boat to some remote place. But many saw them leaving and recognized them, and they hurried on foot from all the towns and arrived there ahead of them. As Jesus came ashore, he saw the large crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he taught them many things. When it was already late, his disciples came to him and said, this is an isolated place, and it is already very late. Send them away so that they can go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said, Should we go and buy bread for two hundred silver coins and give it to them to eat? He said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. Then he directed them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they reclined in groups of hundreds and fifties. He took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. 
He gave them to his disciples to serve the people, and he divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied, and they picked up the broken pieces and fish that were left over, twelve baskets full. Now there were five thousand men who ate the bread. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dispersed the crowd. After saying goodbye to them, he went to the mountain to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. He saw them straining at the oars, because the wind was against them. As the night was ending, he came to them walking on the sea, for he wanted to pass by them. When they saw him walking on the water, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them, Have courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Then he went up with them into the boat, and the wind ceased. They were completely astonished because they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. After they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and anchored there. As they got out of the boat, people immediately recognized Jesus. They ran through the whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever he was rumored to be. And wherever he would go, into villages, towns, or countryside, they would place the sick in the marketplaces and would ask him if they could just touch the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. Oh God, you have, you have so much faith in us and we have so little in you. Why is that? I always find it interesting in reading the story how you were walking on the water and intended to pass them by. And some people think that, that you're being rude or standoffish when they read that. But every time I read that, I imagine the scenario in your head of you're exhausted you have been going a million miles a minute. Um, you were on land. You saw them struggling. And even though you were completely exhausted, you're like, no worries. They saw me with the bread. They saw me with the fish. All I need to do is walk on the water. It'll calm them down. They have faith. And here you go walking on the water. And instead of your closest 12, God, instead of them realizing that they have been there to witness all these amazing miracles you've done and all these people you've talked to uh, about your father, God, and, and what is to come. Your inner circle of 12, and even they don't get it. They think they've seen a ghost. And so instead of doing this, I just need to walk by and then I can go back to maybe getting some sleep because that's all they need. Instead, they completely freak out even more. Oh my goodness, it's a ghost. And you have to go into the boat and comfort them. And I get that you are God and you are almighty God and, and your son and all the things he did. But really, I think about us in our day in and day out. How many times do we already have enough information to make that faith call? And you show up and do a, a drive-by faith assessment. <laughs> Enough to teach us what we need to know at that time. And yet we, we are so fearful and so worried and, and so needy that we need you to climb in the boat with us and go deal with it. Time after time after time again. And yet you never get tired of us, which is amazing to me. I guess God today is as we start our day and look towards growing our relationship with you, that we really look for those opportunities where you are giving us exactly enough. You're giving us exactly what we need at that time uh, to move forward, to make decisions, to do uh, what we're called to do. Don't let us waste your time and other people's time by wallowing. Help us to remember that we are here on earth to glorify you and to tell others about you. But I'm not here to take up other people's time whining past the point <laughs> that I need to, to fuss enough to deal with something. I think back about all the people whose, whose ear I bent and shoulders I cried on 
way past the point that I of what I needed to hear to get on with my life. And yet just that attention and that sympathy and that safe place where I didn't have to deal with the thing that was coming. I guess just felt much better than getting on with life and dealing with things. So God, I'm not saying that there's not stuff we have to deal with. But you've already promised that you will be there for us, that you will only give us what we can handle, um, that you will provide the strength we need, you'll give us an out. You've already promised us all these things. So today, can we work on shortening the wallowing time? <laughs> wallowing in worry, wallowing in fear, wallowing in guilt. All these things that stop us from actually getting our button gear and going and doing things for you. All these selfish things. Yeah. Thank you, God. Thank you so much for having incredible patience with us. Thank you for getting in the boat with us and helping us out during those times where we just don't believe enough in anything to recognize what is happening. I love you very much. In your son's name we pray. Amen.